Hello and welcome to another video from Double Realm. So we're back with uh, Loco Works Wednesday. Uh, hopefully this works uh, out pretty well. Uh, as you can see, um, we've got a new camera angle. Uh, we've mounted the uh, GoPro uh, to the um, underneath of the baseboard, which just happens to be the uh, ceiling here uh, under the uh, workbench. And hopefully uh, you guys will be able to see exactly uh, what I'm doing. And I'll be able to show you parts and stuff like that a lot easier. Uh, so hopefully you guys uh, will like this angle a lot better. Um, hopefully it doesn't sound too echoey. Uh, it's a little bit um, different the acoustics uh, with the camera mounted there. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear me okay. All right, so this is uh, Local Works Wednesday. It's been a long time since I've done a Local Works Wednesday video and I do apologize for that. Um, but we're gonna bring it back. Uh, I've been uh, quite busy and uh, this whole section of layout uh, was quite a big mess. So. Uh, last weekend, I took some time and completely cleared this out um, so it could be reused again. Uh, you can see that we've got our uh, two test tracks uh, up here. Uh, we have our uh, soldering station. Uh, we also have uh, this thing here, which is basically a uh, solder tip cleaner. And uh, it's a lot better than using the uh, foam pad that you'd normally have. Um, you've seen us use in the past. I'm actually quite happy with this. This is a, a really good investment. Um, this thing here is a solder station. You can't quite see it off camera, um, but basically it allows has a heat gun uh, which you can use for uh, soldering uh, service mount technology. Uh, basically use it with a type of soldering paste, which is uh, this stuff right here. And it uh, works pretty well. So we'll be using that as well as our uh, traditional soldering iron uh, when we need to use it and so on. You can see here um, we've got a, a pretty nice uh, workspace. We've got the uh, old Hammett & Morgan uh, Safety Miner uh, which is one of our test uh, controllers and I've got one here uh, which is our Bachman controller too. And just to show you that it works uh, I will go and place a test loco on here and you can see it works pretty well. Yeah, right. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, see things as we as you go on the layout. So today we're doing something a little bit different. Um, as you know, um, we've been doing a lot of 3D printing with uh, Trackside 3D and the RRL stuff. Uh, so today what I decided to do was to use the uh, 3D printer for something a little different. Uh, if you saw on our community tab on our uh, YouTube page, you probably saw some photos of this uh, class. Sorry, this. Uh, Ivet uh, 2MT uh, steam locomotive. It's uh, 41233, and um, it basically uh, had it was a spare some repair that I purchased off eBay about two years ago. I thought it was going to be an easy thing. It had a few couple of broken buffers, uh, a couple of cracked buffer beams. It was missing a few detailing parts. I literally thought, well, it was a good deal. I think it was like twenty dollars or twenty five dollars or something like that. It ran perfectly fine. I thought I'd just contact, uh, you know, Pete Spares or something like that, or, or Bachman and get the spare buffers. Well, it turns out that I couldn't actually get the buffers for this. Um, so it's kind of sat there in a pile along with a couple other locos where I simply couldn't get the parts for it. So um, what I did instead uh, this time around was actually um, uh, 3D print um, the buffer or the uh, missing uh, buffer stops. And uh, you can see there. Um, Missing buffers are, were quite easy to uh, replace. Um, they turned out really well, and you can see um, they're uh, exactly the, the same size as the original ones. Uh, this loco had two buffers that were okay, um, which are the ones here on the back. As you can see there, the uh, ones in the back were okay. And so what I did was I 3D printed ones for the front, and you can see there uh, they're a little shinier because I used uh, gloss paint. I didn't have any flat black paint uh, sitting around. Um, but it turned out pretty well. There's no uh, funky 3D printer marks on it or anything like that. And um, you can't really tell that it's not supposed to be there. Um, while I was at it, I also 3D printed the front steps because those parts were missing. And I used photos of the uh, Steam Loco. Uh, to, do, to do that, and you can see also the rear step, that one was missing, so that's the one I 3D printed. And then this one was one that was already there, um, and so on. So uh, that was quite straightforward. Um, the only real repair I had to do to it is uh, this 
buffer beam was actually cracked. So aside from the buffer beam missing, uh, it was actually uh, cracked down the center and you can't really see that anymore. Um, and the way I fixed that was quite simple. I used uh, this Loctite uh, glue pen. And I basically, um, Loctite glue pen is actually really cool for uh, modeling. Um, it has a little tip on the end of it. If you can uh, see that, and you basically just press it down so um, I do like that, and it just pulls glue out of it, and you can get really precise, um, and it's great for adding uh, detailing parts and so on. So I used that to glue the buffer beam um, together, and then I used this pair of pliers, uh, needle nose pliers, and basically just squeezed uh, the thing in place, holding it in place until it set, and then I waited about a minute or two after it set before I let go of it. And then um, we simply dropped in the uh, gray uh, pieces. Now I did make a mistake, well not really a mistake, but I made the choice of actually gluing all the 3D printed parts uh, into it before I painted them. And the reason I did that um, was mainly just so you could see from the photos and so on um, that it was actually 3D printed and it wasn't just parts that I put on. Uh, one thing I might do is I might uh, 3D print with black PLA next time. Um, but really the painting didn't uh, cause any problems um, and I used a uh, tester's uh, gloss black paint to um, to paint it and I'll probably weather it down uh, eventually when I get a chance. Um, there were a couple other details that I wanted to add to it uh, just based off the photos uh, so I might 3D print those as well and of course um, what I'll do is I'll make the parts uh, available um, via trackside 3D uh, so you'll be able to download them and 3D print them yourself if you need to do the same repairs. So I'm gonna be doing this quite a lot. And um, I have hundreds of locos. A lot of them have missing detailing parts. A lot of them are spares and repairs. And a lot of them are just old and they, they need fixed. Um, so I'll be 3D printing stuff um, once or twice a week, and specifically to repair locos for local work Wednesdays. Um, if there's a specific loco that you need parts for that you'd like me to do this for, uh, just put it in the comments uh, or put it on the community tab and I'll try to get to it when I can. Um, it didn't take very long at all to give you an idea. Um, the buffers here took me about, I would say, two or three minutes to uh, figure out the dimensions. Um, and then it was more trial and error. So um, it took maybe 10, 15 minutes to knock it up in Blender and print it to the 3D printer. It's taking about two or three minutes for the 3D printer to print one. Um, and then it was a matter of just getting the size right. So. Um, the first time around I had some of the distances a little bit off, so I adjusted those until it looked right. And I compared it with uh, photos of the loco to make sure it looked like the actual loco did. Um, and it's turned out pretty well. And I'll show you some different angles you now uh, from this top down view. It's not as easy uh, to see, but it's uh, it's turned out real nice. So I uh, just show you guys showing it running. Uh, we'll put it on here. Now this loco really was just cosmetic damage. Um, and we fixed that with a 3D printer and the 3D printer parts. Um, and it turned out really well. So I think this is a bit of a game changer. Um, I think uh, we'll be able to do some interesting repairs and upgrades uh, to different locos uh, just using the 3D printer. So I'm uh, quite, quite happy with the results and I'm uh, looking forward to see what I can do with it going forward. All right, so the main part of this video today is actually gonna be this uh, Class 92. Um, so this class 92 it does have a missing buffer beam or a buffer, um, but I'm not going to 3D print that today. Um, I might do it uh, later in the week if I have time, but I'm not going to do that yet. So this was actually brand new. Um, it, it looked out really well on eBay. I got this, a uh, couple of um, larger tank um, wagons. I got this Lima class 87 and um, I also picked up another loco as well I think it was a um, another Lima um, class 87 there's two class 87s this is 92 and some uh, wagons and I got the whole thing for like 30 bucks on eBay and uh, I was expecting it to be like you know just spares and repairs but it turned out that this was brand new um, this had never been run uh, you can check under the wheels you can see there so um, until I ran the double rail really out about half an hour ago um, this thing literally was brand spanking new. So one of the things that I found out was uh, as soon as I got around a loop, it started to make a horrible noise and slow down. Uh, so obviously it's a ring filled motor and so I needed to go and figure out what was going on. So what was happening was uh, once I got it apart, 
I was able to tell that the uh, commutator was actually moving uh, back and forth. So you can see here, um, you have the cog and basically the cog was moving out. And because the cog was moving out, it was no longer catching in the gear. And so it wasn't turning the wheels. So as it moved outwards, it was only half catching the wheels. So it was turning one side and turning the other side with a lot slower, which is why the loco slowed down. And then it would come to a complete stop when this thing got far enough out that it basically, um, you know, was no longer turning the thing at all. So, why was it doing that? Well, it turns out that this uh, slightly newer um, ring field motor has a uh, plastic piece that sits on top that's supposed to stop it from moving back and forth. <coughs> well, it turns out, and uh, the black pe plastic piece is right here in black, uh, it turns out that over time, uh, this plastic piece uh, got slightly bigger, uh, not much, probably about a fraction of a millimeter, um, but got big enough um, that it was basically starting to slide um, off of the, sorry, it's starting to slide um, off of the, uh, I guess pull, I'm not sure what you call it, <laughs> uh, rail, I don't know. Um, it was basically sliding off this thing. So basically the plastic piece would pop off and then this would also move up. Now I thought maybe it was like some of the older ones. Uh, some of the older ones, let's see here. This is uh, basically what it looks like on the inside. Um, so because this was moving back and forth, uh, you see it normally doesn't move. And then normally this end here is clamped, right? So this, you have to use a vice grips uh, to put them on. But it looks like the newer ones, which are no longer brass, um, have this plastic piece instead. Now I've seen some of them where they have like a nut or sort of a clamp on the end that's metal. Um, but this newer one, it was plastic and obviously it had uh, slightly um, increased in size and it was loose. And so it was basically causing the commentator to move back and forth. And when the commentator was moving back and forth, it wasn't, uh, I wasn't making full contact with the brushes, so it made that horrible brush noise. Uh, so if you've got a, a slightly newer uh, ring field motor, sometimes these pop off and then, you know, th that's the problem. But these newer ones, if it's any kind of play in it at all, it's gonna cause it to look like it's a brush problem, but it's not a brush problem at all. And the brushes on this one are brand new, so I knew it definitely wasn't a brush problem. So what I did was uh, I looked on uh, Pete spares and uh, you can't actually get the replacement parts but it's just a piece of plastic so it's like well why don't I try to 3d print it so I uh, brought the ruler out measured the uh, size of it and then uh, pulled up a cylinder in a blender to the same specs and made it slightly thicker I'm not sure if you can see that's about I think this original one's about half a millimeter um, so I made this one a full millimeter in size um, and then I increased a you know, create a second cylinder and uh, use that to cut the hole out through the center. And so the second cylinder is uh, just one or two and a quarter uh, millimeters, uh, which is exactly the same size as this. Uh, so they are a little tricky to get on, um, but once you get them on, uh, it works pretty well. Uh, to get it on, you can see um, on the back here, there's this, uh, the other end of it. So you gotta hold that in place with something uh, substantial. I use these uh, tweezers. Uh, you could use the pliers or something else. And then you basically have to work it on um, with the screwdriver. So you put it on the end, you just sort of push down on one side, push it on the other side, make sure there's no play in it. And um, it seems to work okay. So what I'm gonna do next is uh, go ahead and assemble it. But before I do, uh, I know I haven't shown it to any video and people sometimes complain that I don't do this, is um, explain how to disassemble it. So I do have videos where I show how to disassemble a large number of different ring full motor locomotives. Uh, but I'll show you real quick because the technique is pretty simple. So this is the uh, bogey and the uh, motor actually fits down inside it uh, like so. Uh, so if you notice, and uh, there's two clamps, right? There's a kind of a upside down um, L-shaped clamp right there. And then there's this kind of more triangular shaped one uh, right down this side. So what you do is just, you sit inside the uh, the bogey like so, right? Or inside the body shell. And so what you have to do is with a small screwdriver 
is basically push back on this triangular shape one, which is the one on the inside to locate. You just have to really push it too far, but you just kind of turn it at about a nine, you know, what, maybe 45 degrees, and you push back on it, and then you pull it out gently. And what it does is you push back just enough on it, it'll pop it out of loco, and then this part just pulls right out. And you gotta be careful because there's two wires. There's uh, one wire and another wire that both go uh, to the motor. So you can see here, uh, one goes on, it's kind of in the center, and one goes on the back. And so you gotta be real careful, uh, take those off before you try to pull the motor away or you could damage the wiring. Um, and then basically you'll end up with this in the body. So to get it out of the body, um, if you look on the back here, there's like a slot. Um, what you have to do, it's quite tricky, especially if it's a new, is to push back down on this. And what it'll do is you're basically pushing this notch out of the clamp that's right here. And then you get it, this, while you're pushing back on this, you basically take your thumb or something else and you push up on the wheels so it pops out. And then when it pops out, you just pull the motor out. What you're left with is this. Now be careful because the wheels in the center are dummy wheels, so they'll fall right on off. Uh, so it's a good idea to do it over uh, something like this. Um, and then you're free to uh, take the motor apart. So to take the motor apart, and uh, the first thing you do is there's this copper clip um, that holds the uh, gear wheels in place. And so you pop that off and then you pull the top gear, larger gear wheels off and then pull the smaller gear wheels off. And then you're left with this exposed and then um, there's enough play in this for this to pop off, so it's pretty straightforward. So now I've got this installed and this new uh, ring field uh, clamp thing uh, that I've made from the 3D printer. Um, we're gonna go and test it out and see if it works. So I'm gonna actually show you how I reassemble it since it's ready to go here and we'll go from there. All right. So first things first, you gotta put the uh, small motor pieces back on, and they go. It's two holes, the, or two uh, kind of. Uh, I guess they're. I don't know what you call them. I don't know what you call them. Um, standouts. I don't know. They're. Uh, it's uh, way too early in the morning for me here. Um, but yeah, basically, it's two axle. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Someone help me out here. Go and uh, put in the comments what these things are called. If you can't see what I'm talking about, um, basically this thing right here. Um, so I'm not sure what you call those. Uh, but anyway, goes on there. And then these RC small inside gears uh, go on the back like so. And then the second one also goes on there like so. Then what I typically do is before I go to the whole trouble of putting the copper piece back on um, is I just sort of hold it like this and I think I'm going to need to get better lighting in here but um, I basically just run it with my finger and make sure that there's no crazy play in it and that it turns okay. And one thing with this new clamp is you don't want it to be too tight against this otherwise it will cause some friction and stop it from moving. Um, but so far looks pretty good so um, you can hopefully see it's moving there I, uh, you can flick it around you can't see it moving um, but basically as as I'm moving it it's basically doing this on the inside um, so next step is to put this clamp back on and the clamp goes uh, one way it goes in like that and then just move it on up so it goes over the two One and two, so you put here it clipped in place, and um, that's how it looks. All right, so next thing to do is to pop these uh, dummy wheels back on. And the thing I have noticed is this dummy wheel is apparently missing the plastic insert. I'm not sure if I lost it or if it was. Never there in the first place. That's weird. All right, not gonna worry about that. Maybe I can 3D print one of those later too. Uh, I'm not gonna be too worried about it though. Um, no, no, maybe not. The other side's just the same way. That's weird. 
one axle is like that, one axle isn't. Oh, oh I see what it is. It's the plastic insert from the gear wheel, so there's no gears on the side, so that's probably what it is. It's been a while since I've done logo repairs, as you can tell. Alright, not a big deal. Okay, so next, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that's the other reason why, by the way, there hasn't been too many uh, double rail uh, videos since September. I've had flu, you know, flu illness, and I'm almost back 100%. Uh, so hopefully, yeah, of course it's gonna do that. So um, next thing you need to be careful of is make sure you put the motor the uh, right way back into the thing, um, which probably something I probably should have paid attention to when I was putting it together. Uh, but I'm pretty sure. Um, Yeah, we're just going this way. Um, You hear there, it's clipped into place. I just have to be careful with it. You can see there, it's that older plastic, it's a little bit bowed, but it's uh, pulling out. One thing I don't like about this Class 92 is it's got these little Philly insert bits that uh, don't always want to play along. Um, also, want to make sure you don't uh, damage anything there, but it's uh, looking good. Uh, looks like it's all in, in good shape. And it went back in all right. So, all right. So there you can see the uh, finished product. So there's uh, one wire that's going to go on there. The other wire is going to go in there. It's the blue one I think that goes on here, and then the black one that goes on the um, thing. I'm going to make sure it still moves, uh, which it does. So that's good. So next up, we're going to go and uh, put the wires back on. Uh, I'm going to put this one back on at first because it's the uh, trick for the two to get right. You can see that uh, on the video. It slides on like so. And then the other one. Slides on like that. You can see there. I'll show you blue ones on there, and then the black one is down there like the soap. And so I'm going to show you now how it goes back in, right? So assuming that coupling wants to play along, um, basically put, let me see on the camera, um, that piece goes under that in the, um, thing in the pentagraph inside the pop up. And there you go. It's actually in, which it is. Alright, so next up, we're going to go and test it on test track. So give me a minute to get that roll, and we'll. Uh... Alright, so next up, we're going to go and actually test it. So I'm going to remove this liquor, and now this liquor is kind of large, so we're not going to quite get. A good test run on it, so I'm gonna probably test it out on the main layout here in a minute as well. Oh. Seems to be moving okay, a lot better than it was when I started. Motor sounds okay, it sounds actually pretty smooth. All right, so you can see here the magic to fix in the ring fill motor. Is this uh, little plastic piece right here? Um, so what we're going to do is uh, make those available on Trackside 3D. I'll um, put it up over the next day or so. Maybe uh, by the time we have our update video on Saturday morning, uh, they'll be up there. All right. So I'm going to go and uh, leave you guys with a few shots of uh, the uh, 
two MT um, IVET here. It's a two six two tank. Uh, you can check out the uh, 3D printed parts on that, and um, we'll have a little bit more about this too in the 3D printing video on um, on Saturday morning. And I'm going to probably uh, now go test um, the rail freight class 92 on the layout for a little while as well. All right, so um, yeah, so. I let the thing run for uh, about an hour and uh, it started to slow down again. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I should uh, take a look at it and see what's going on. Um, so you can see here, um, I have disassembled the motor again. Uh, same kind of deal. Um, this here is, I'll show you what the problem is. So um, my little washer thing here, um, which I put on the end of the uh, motor uh, to keep this thing in place. Uh, it worked really well. In fact, it worked so well it kept this thing in place uh, long enough for the inside of it to get even more kind of bored out, I guess, by the um, the peg that goes through the commentator. Uh, so this now um, is so loose that what was happening was it was um, it was spinning around on the peg. So this thing that's right in here, it basically was spinning around on it. Um, so the commentator was moving. Um, so basically, what was happening was the motor. This is the other one, um, but basically the motor was turning this, but because the metal one you can see is uh, so loose on it, it, it basically wasn't turning the thing with it. Um, so it basically just worn it out. So I was like, eh, so that means I was gonna have to get a brass one. Usually you take the vice grips and you sort of compress it. So I was like, well, maybe I should try a 3D printer since, you know, I was doing that, and so that's basically what I've done. If you uh, look there now at the uh, center washer or center cog, it is uh, 3D printed, and then it has my washer thing that we showed you um, on there as well. And it does actually work. So if I put the other peg on there, and or sorry, other cog on there, and um, if I uh, spin it, you can see it is indeed moving the commentator. Um, now one thing I did notice was that on some of my older Triang, or I guess the Hornby, um, Locos, this cog here had uh, 12 um, pieces on it, right? But this one only has 11, and I went through, and so the, the cogs seem to be like a little different. Uh, they're not brass, obviously. So I was wondering why it really needs to be plastic, and I'm thinking, not plastic, why it needs to be metal. I'm thinking it needs to be metal um, because if it was plastic, you wouldn't actually be able to push it onto this thing with the vice grips. Or if I try to push that on with the vice grips, it was gonna, you know, just break if it's plastic. Um, but you know, these ones are plastic, so plastic on plastic shouldn't wear it down. So maybe it was a manufacturing limitation when these things were out. Um, but you can see there, um, we had no manufacturing limitation with the 3D printer. Um, I'll show you some iterations. So. Um, I first started it off with a basic cog um, at 45 degree angles. That didn't work very well. It was just more to see if I could actually 3D print a cog. Um, so the next thing I did was this one here, uh, which is the right uh, 70 20, and uh, that gave you 12. Worked pretty well, and it uh, seamlessly works with the um, with the thing. So if I take the other cog and I can, I can see, you can see if I do it this way. It um, it maybe it moves back and forth along the thing um, freely, so it means like the teeth are a good mesh. I don't know if you can see that, um, but basically, if I it's kind of hard to do this way, uh, but you can see there it's it's moving quite freely, uh, which means I got the angle right and the other stuff going on. Um, if I try it with the four peg one, you know, the four five angle one, you might be able to see it a little bit better. It's kind of a little fiddly. Um, it doesn't doesn't want to move as freely with it. Um, so anyway, so what I did was the uh, first one I printed uh, was too small. Uh, second one I printed had the same problem as the metal one, um, but the uh, the final one I printed, uh, which is on the motor, um, seems to work okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and reassemble this. And then we'll see if it works here on the test track. And if it does, I will go send it around for another hour and see if it breaks. And if it doesn't, well, we'll throw the other cog up on um, trackside 3D as well. 
All right, so give me a minute to put it back together, and we'll. All right, so uh, before I go put it back together, I thought I'd just show it to you. It's oiled up. It's all working fine. Um, so I'm gonna finish reassembling it, put it in the loco, and see what we get. Uh, I have no idea what this is gonna do to the performance of the loco. But... All right, so we've got the train back on the track. Um, you can see here, I've got the metal piece uh, that was in it, along with some duplicates uh, that I 3D printed right here. So, plastic pieces in the train. Let's see if it runs. Oh, it goes backwards. Let's see if it goes forwards. Yeah, it goes forwards pretty well. And it goes back again. All right, so it seems to work. So I'm gonna go and put it on the track, on the main layout, and let it run for a while, and see if it holds up. If it holds up, you guys will get to see this video. If it doesn't hold up, well, you won't. All right, so hopefully this is it now uh, for this video. And if it is, um, I'll also add the cog uh, to the Trackside 3D website probably over next day or so. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that there's lots of advantages to the 3D printing. And uh, it's a great companion for, for all railways. All right, so that's it for this video. Uh, please, uh, of course, leave uh, your comments below, uh, like get some feedback, uh, get communication going. Uh, we also have the community tab that I've uh, started to use, so hopefully you guys will get that. If you are a subscriber, uh, there's that little bell thing. I know I've had a lot of subscribers uh, for many years, and so I think the, by default the, the um, notifications don't always show up. Uh, so if you want to get notified when uh, I release a new video, uh, go hit that bell, and uh, I'll make sure that you're you know, get notified when I upload videos. All right, so like I said, that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys uh, are excited to have uh, Loco Works Wednesday back and hopefully the audio worked all right. Um, in